Hi there everyone, we have a very special guest today. It's Grant Sanderson from the YouTube channel Three Blue, One Brown. Now this is a mathematics YouTube channel. So Grant, why is it called Three Blue, One Brown? Well, it has nothing to do with math. I foolishly decided to name it after a piece of my own physiology. My right <laughs> eye color, um, it's three quarters blue and then one quarter brown. Okay. Uh, technically it's called sectoral heterochromia. I think I always identify as like, ooh, it's sort of a special, unique genetic thing. And like the logo being a picture that's like an artistic rendering of this kind of eye pattern seemed apropos because it's about visualizing math. James, come on, we want to get in close here. This is exactly what I should have anticipated, but really don't necessarily enjoy. <laughs> I'm just thinking how happy I am that Brady didn't name this channel after a part of his own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would have called it biceps. Oh, okay. Fine. No, okay. Grant, I know you feel a bit awkward about attention being drawn to your eye. To help move away from that, we have decided to get out a whole bunch of pictures of eyes and eyeballs Whoa. and things for you from the Royal Society collection. I thought it would be more like mathematician stuff. <laughs> well, I, do, I like to keep you guessing. Okay. What have you pulled together here, Keith? Well, they're images of eyes and mostly they're drawn from the illustrations that went into the philosophical transactions. This is good maths for me and Brady because we can both count to two. I want to start with this one, Keith, can we? This is good, isn't it? Yes. So you can probably just see a signature down at the bottom there, Charles Bell. Bell was a medical man. He was interested in the anatomy of the eye and particularly how it moved. So what you've mm. got here is, is the human eye and you've got the musculature around it. Bell is, is famous. He has a disease named after him, which is, is always good, mm. Bell's palsy. So you have a side view just here. They're not just telling you what they're discovering, they're showing you as well. And like this would be beautifully shaded yeah. and <laughs> this would be engraved up as, as a plate for the for the journal. This is uh, This is a human eye too. That's getting closer to your colour as well, Grant, I think. Oh, a yeah, bit, that's yeah. a bit blue, that one. Got that's the, the uh, highly competitive channel, one blue. One blue. <laughs> I hate that guy. <laughs> but this is Francis Bauer, who's about the best watercolour artist of this period. And he's illustrating a paper by Everard Hume again for the Philosophical Transactions on the structure of the eye. I mean, I'm asking you a physiology question, maybe more than a history one, but what are the little fibres that he's drawing here? He's presumably gradually cutting down the eye and sectioning it. I don't know what these fibres are here. Keith's uh, a librarian, <laughs> he's not an optometrist. <laughs> over, to, over to you, Brady. I thought that was an onion. <laughs> Let's move on and gloss over our lack of knowledge about eyes. Is this like images of the retina and like with the blind spot? Yeah, so it's the back of the eye here, yeah. looking at the optic nerve. There is one fact I know about eyes. So this is like where all the blood is flowing into it, right? If you're God and you're designing an eye, you might put all of those blood vessels behind where it's actually receiving light. Um, but instead it's sitting in front of it. So every image that you see, there's actually a bunch of shadows from the blood vessels and your brain just learns not to see those shadows. I love an eye expert, don't you, Brady? There you go, you heard it here first. I, I, I told you you knew a lot about eyes. That's the one, that's the one fact I know. <laughs> Who did these, Keith? The by guy called George Lindsay Johnson. He wrote a couple of papers for the Philosophical Transactions looking across mammalian eyes. So this is a Bactrian camel eye here. Lama. This is a Peruvian llama's eye. Okay. I bet you didn't think you were going to get to see the retina of a sperm whale today. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> Very low on the list of things I would have guessed. We got a domestic goat and a Grecian wild goat. Oh, that's a Hercus and that's a Dorcas. Hercus and Dorcas. Hercus and Dorcas. The children's book writes itself. <laughs> it does. And now for free lunch after we film, okay. you have to tell us what that is an eye of. It feels like it's not enough to be an insect, but it's too weird to be something closely related to humans. I'm gonna go with some kind of reptile, like frogs or like a, a frog? newt. It's a cod. A cod, okay. Yeah, so yeah. You're on so the right track. Yeah, yeah. It's from a paper by David Brewster, who's uh, very famous for this kind of science. And he's trying to explain the structure of the lens and what it does. So he's comparing it here to, uh, this is a glass bead viewed under the microscope through polarized light. Look, I'll tell you what, Grant, I've been mean to you today <laughs> and I haven't given you much mathematics, but Keith has done you a bit of a favour and we've got you a few little things here involving four mathematicians. Oh, who, you threw me a bone. Who I, knew you, who I knew you were keen on. Keith, when someone becomes a fellow of the Royal Society, there is, what's it, is it an election certificate? Well, yeah, so there's an election process. So you first become a candidate for fellowship uh, and uh, in, in past times, uh, an a certificate would be hung in the meeting room so that uh, when fellows of the Royal Society came into the building, they could sign as a supporter to mm. your fellowship of the Royal Society. 
and eventually, hopefully, you would be elected. Who have we got first? So this is Mr. Oh, Fourier. Fourier. Oh, that's awesome. Perpetual Secretary of the Royal Academy of Sciences in Paris, having long been known as the author of several important mathematical and physical investigations, we recommend him as a person highly proper to be placed on the list of foreign members of the Royal Society. It feels like a very British understatement. And if we look at the people who've signed under here and vouched for Fourier, who have we got here, Keith? So we've got uh, the president at the top, that's Humphrey Davy. Yeah. William Hyde Wallison, another chemist just underneath him. John Herschel. Charles Babbage there, of course, who has a certain amount of yeah. kudos in mathematical and, and computer Certainly. science yeah. circles. That is a bit of a who's who to have signing for you. 1823 this is. All right, let's have a look at this one. You've done some videos on Thomas Bayes, haven't you? As we're speaking, I'm working on one. We propose and recommend him as a gentleman of known merit, well-skilled in geometry and all parts of mathematical and philosophical learning, and every way qualified to be a valuable member of, of the same. He has a bit of aristocratic support there. There's uh, Earl Stanhope, Martin Folkes, who was uh, president of the Royal Society. James Burrow is there. You can see he's elected November the 4th, 1742. We've got two more, and these are two of the absolute megastars of mathematical history. Here we have Euler. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely. Of the Royal Imperial Academies of Sciences of Berlin and St. Petersburg, eminent by his mathematical and philosophical works, and every way qualified to be a useful member of our society and a reputation to the same. And again, you have the, the list of signatures there. And similar kinds of people, this is the same period, 1746 here. James Bradley, who's an astronomer. So it's a good yeah. bunch of people again. So it's a balloted and elected January the 22nd, 1746 to 7. That's old style and hmm. a new style for the calendar change. <laughs> In the year 174 and six sevenths. And here we go. Now we have. Oh, this is a long one. I think he's got the best list of names as well. It's Frederick good. Gauss. Yeah. So Frederick Gauss of Brunswick in Germany, author of a learned treatise on the higher parts of arithmetic, who by instituting nice calculations upon the observations of the planet Ceres, made by Mr. Piazzi within the small period of six weeks, enabled Baron Zach and Dr. Obers each separately to rediscover it after it had been lost 10 or 11 months. All this famous stuff Gauss did, and here they're just saying he helped some astronomers we, find a lost we asteroid. We lost Ceres, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he helped us track it down. The astronomers are really, really behind him. Yeah. So yeah. William Herschel is, is right in. William Herschel. Here's Joseph Banks, who's president oh, of the Royal Society. One of my, one here. Of my favorites, Joseph yeah. Banks. Here's Neville Maskelyne, who's uh, astronomer royal. So yeah, he's got some pretty good names in there. Okay then, Grant, so you've seen some mathematical election certificates. You've seen a lot of eyes. I've seen a lot of eyes. I love them? that, by the way. All joking aside, that's actually fascinating stuff. What's your favorite thing on the table that you saw today? Maybe actually the cod. The cod eyes. eye? Yeah, yeah. The cod eye. There it's, we go. It's upside down, Brady. <laughs> Not to, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Looks symmetric to me. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the cod eye, which I clearly know very little about. The thing that makes this machine so delightful is how it enables us to take a signal consisting of multiple frequencies and pick out what they are. Imagine taking the two signals we just looked at, the wave with three beats per second and the wave with two beats per second, and add them up. Like I said earlier, what you get is no longer a nice pure cosine wave, it's something a little more complicated. But imagine throwing this into our winding frequency machine. 